Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 23rd of the eighth month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which happens to line up with the um, 4th of November, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. And we're continuing with our reading of Bereshith, or Genesis, where we have had Abraham sojourning in the land, and he's been trustworthy in all the trials that have come upon him so far. He's stayed true to our creator, although listening to the voice of his wife, he had a child outside of the uh, covenant with his wife, Ishmael. But he's also had the promised seed born to him now and celebrated that. And now we're coming to uh, chapter 23. As we go through this, uh, there's not really much I want to point out. I'm going to little things here and there. But what I really want you to do, and this is for anyone that watches the video, I talked about this last time where we went over the different types of uh, ways things are parables in scripture that foretell the future. We went over this with the birth of Yitzhak, how you can see all the Aleph Tau's and all that it's pointed out. It went over that with the Passover encounter that he read where he offered his son. What we don't see there is that he was about 25 years old when that happened, as mentioned in Josephus. And as you can calculate from the book of Yobelim, if I remember correctly. But um, he was about 30 years old is the thing it's around the same time. And it's the promised seed. It was a type and picture of our Mashiach. Okay. But back on track here. This one also has Aleph Taos throughout the text. And I would really appreciate, I'm not, going to point out anything significant about them but i'd like everyone that listens to look at where these are to see what's being pointed out and then just to think about what that can be saying when we know that the aleph tau he says i am the aleph and the tau the first and last beginning and says yahuwah and that is our mashiach speaking he is the word from the bosom of the father right so um a lot of people have made the comments that this denotes dominion of or authority over he's the stamping his mark on them as the one who is the uh possessor of the creator of and the one who controls you can see that kind of when it's in the beginning where it's aleph tau the heavens and aleph tau the earth in english it says or the shamayim and the, the aretz right but um there's other things you can see here. And when you point out and you look at where these are throughout this text, it might show you something interesting. So I don't want to blow it up or give it away. I'm just going to read this. And please, if you see that and you think about it, whatever comes to mind, share. Bring it, you know, share in the comments or the video if you want to. This is his gift to men to reveal the truth in our inner heart about the, the what we can see in his word. Okay. Bereshit 23, 1 through 20. <clears throat> and Sarah lived 127 years, the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Then Abraham rose up beside his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth saying, I am a foreigner and a sojourner among you. Give me property for a burial site among you so that I bury my dead from my presence. Literally, from before my face. It says, And the sons of Heth answered Eth Abraham, saying to him, Hear us, my master, Eth you, are a prince of Elohim among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial sites. None of us withholds from you, Eth, his burial site, from burying Eth, your dead. So Abraham rose and bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. And he spoke Eth with them, saying, if it is, Eth, your desire that I bury Aleph Tal, or Eth, my dead, from my presence, hear me, and approach Ephron, son of Zohar, for me, 
and let me have at the cave of Mechpelah, which he has, which is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me for a complete amount of silver as property or a burial site among you. And I was just reminded there is actually a video with Ron Wyatt where he found the cave of Mikpalah. He had discovered it in part of his archaeological digs that he was doing in the land. And I believe it was at that site when he was taking a reprieve from digging around where our, our Mashiach was impaled to look for um, the Ark of the Covenant. While he was at Mikpalah, he actually saw a vision of a messenger that told him not to lose heart and to continue with what he was doing. So it's pretty amazing, but I'll I'll share that with you and let you see that for yourselves. Whether or not you want to believe him, I'll leave that in your hands. But if you look at the evidence that, of what he was given and you listen to what he said, he was a pretty humble man. He wasn't arrogant, definitely wasn't proud, and uh, he realized that he could have done nothing without prayer and and seeking from the Father. So his whole his whole witness about how he discovered Noah's Ark and the other things, pretty amazing. And um, I'd recommend everyone looking at that too. Just one moment. All right, sorry about that. And it says, and Ephron dwelt among the sons of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite or the Hitti answered at Abraham. In the hearing of the sons of Heth, all who entered at the gate of his city, saying, No, my master, listen to me. I shall give you the field and the cave that is in it. I shall give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I shall give it to you, bury your dead. And this is Abraham who was told by the almighty creator of all things that he would be given everything in this land, all that he sees. He wasn't taking that as an arrogant thing where he was going to take what belonged to another right now, it, because he also remembered that he would be sojourners in the land, not his own. So he was cognizant of those things and he did things respectively. This is another one of the, the 10 trials that came upon him that we will read about more distinctly in the book of Yobelim, that he was an overcomer in because he did not have a bad attitude. He took what happened to him in Shalom, and he was following what is loving towards others. You just read the stories and the accounts that happened, right? And Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land, and he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If only you would hear me, I shall give you the amount of silver for the field. Take it from me and let me bury Eth my dead there. And Ephron answered Eth Abraham, which means father of many nations, right? Or exalted father of nations. Saying to him, my master, listen to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? So bury at your dead. And Abraham listened to Ephron. And Abraham weighed out at the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, currency of the merchants. Thus the field of Ephron, which was in Mechpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was in it, and all the trees that were in the field, which were within all the surrounding borders, were deeded to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the sons of Heth, before all who went in at the gate of his city. That word for deeded doesn't mean... Uh, necessarily that it's why you come or literally and he stood so literally and he placed it or and he stood it up as a fact that that calm or that comb just like the a rooster's comb is what's standing up on their head that word means to stand up or to be erect or to, to be uh standing so why it's traded or why it's translated as deeded here i i have no idea 
It says, and after this, Abraham buried Eth Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Thus the field and the cave that is in it were deeded, or and they were standed, they were stood to Abraham by the sons of Heth as property for a burial site. If you give me just one moment, I wanted to show you here. That that word for standing, right? Or that word for deed. Just so you can see that it's peculiar there. And then again, you can see all the instances where the Aleph Tau, they'll have it in the text in the Hebrew, and sometimes it's not translated. Other times they'll has it they'll have it translated as with, which actually Eth means with, and if you add that W, like you do, like I was mentioning with Odin, Woden, Wood, um, now, if you do that with if you have with, so it's the same word, and that's that general use of it, but that's not the only thing that it meant. This is part of, when you're looking into Hebrew, there's a lot of things where words what they sound like now, what they sounded like then, and words that they are derived from them can be pretty different. But when you look at these things, it becomes more clear. As you study it, as you learn, just take your time. Don't be dogmatic about things that you're not sure about. Right? Here we go. So we're deeded over. Wayakam, and it says, and he stood. Which if you click on that, Kom, kof, wa, mem, right? Kum, like a comb, the rooster's comb, is to arise, stand up, or stand. But this is how they have it translated throughout. When we just had the KJV key to the Strong's, before the encyclical from the little horn that requested that people would make more versions of scripture, which if you pay attention, it says after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon shall not give its light and the stars shall fall, right? After the dark ages, the tribulation, the inquisitions of those days, the, the sun being darkened was his word being tampered with the removal of his name with the beginning of the second woe and the Wycliffe translation all the way to these multiple uh, translations being put out that muddy the waters and really, really do a horrible job of conveying the truth. It, it was all foretold. If we take the parables and what he defined them as in his word and then just put it in with what he said. So we know that the word or the light, for example, is the word, is the Torah, right? The light or the stars, the children of light are his people. The moon is the kingdom. It's something that we covered before pretty exhaustively in that Gad the Seer chapter one video. But if you just take what his word says about these things, not any opinion of our own, and then you put it in these things in the natural order of the narratives, in the parables, in it all starts to make sense. And then you can see that he's literally speaking in parables everywhere. It's a, it's a story within a story. So anyways, you can see it's predominantly stand, establish, okay, which is something standing. That's the general thing, but they have it as deed. So... We can do deed as a piece of paper. What this was is he literally had this as standing or as fact before witnesses, Abraham himself and all the people, which is what that was pointing out. But you kind of miss that when you just have it that way. So, ob willing. And then again, you can see eth, not translated. I wanted to show you an example of where it might be translated, though, because they do have that as well. I don't know if it's in this chapter or not, but. That one's not, yeah. Here we go. It's wa'eth is and so, but you're dead. But literally, 
wa is the conjunction. So they have that as so, and this isn't translated again. All right. That miot is a hundred, which I thought was an interesting word. The other one down here for miot actually has the wa there. So it's like miot. That word for aleph wa tau is an oat, which is a sign. It's where we get the word for an oath in right here. But when you add a mem in front of it, that's a hundred. So that was pretty interesting, but that's nothing for us right now. Let me look on the other one real quick before we read. Yeah, that one's not translated either. That one's not translated. This one's not translated. Okay. Let me switch real quick because I want to give you a example before we move on. And you can see that sometimes, most often, they don't have it translated. Here's another example where they have na. It's all throughout this chapter in particular. Well, they'll have na. Instead of saying now, they put it as please. But I put that as now throughout the text, and you can see it a little differently. There's another one not translated. There's another one not translated. I'm hitting them all. I'm sorry, you guys. There's another one. <laughs> Here's another one. So, I well, anyways, at least you can go through here, and if you want, you can pause as you go to get a better look, or you can go to the Strong's Interlinear uh, yourself. I use the Bible Hub version, and you can do this as well, which I highly encourage. Here's another one of the Nas, which is translated as please, but I put as now. Here we go. Eta. Right, Ota, they say, but this is her. Her really is just the hey at the end. The Aleph Tau is the is a kind of a marker there. When you have him, it's just the wa, but they have an Aleph Tau as well sometimes. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and skip it now because I'm not finding one. I'm sorry. I know I've seen them. I've been, I was just looking at that this morning, but it is not something I'm finding real quick here. And I don't want to waste any more time. So please forgive me. You'll have to come check these out as well. And then you'll see here's that makum. There's that kum. They make room. So there's an interesting one. But anyways, if you look at this, you'll see where the Aleph Tau is used. And then you can see what it's used with and where. And this one's a very long chapter. It has it quite a bit all over the place, but I'm just not, I'm not finding it myself right now. And I don't want to sit here and waste too much more of your time. So we'll move on. Oh, that's, that's the wrong one. We'll continue here. Chapter 24. And then you can compare these on your own. I highly suggest you do that. Don't just take my word for anything, right? But right here, we're continuing. He just bought the burial site. And it says, And Abraham was old, advanced in years, and Yahuwah had Baruch, or blessed, eth Abraham in every way. And Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had. His name was Eleazar, and in the Recognitions of Clement, which is the preaching of Kepha, he explains that Eleazar as actually his heir to inherit everything until Ishmael was born. But he says to him, put now, that word na, right? He says, put now your hand under my thigh, so that I make you swear by Yahuwah, the Elohim of the Shemaim and the Elohim of the earth or land, that you do not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanim, among whom I dwell, but to go to my land and to my relatives and take a wife from my son or for my son Yitzach. <clears throat> and the servant said to him, What if the woman refuses to follow me to this land? Do I then take Eth, your son, back to the land from which you came? 
And Abraham said to him, Beware, lest you take Eth my son back there. Yahuwah Elohim of Shamayim, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my relatives, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your seed I give Eth the land. The reason why Yitzhak never left the land. Just like the reason why Shalomo didn't have the kingdom split under him because of the promise given to Dawid, right? He says, He sends his messenger before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. And if the woman refuses to follow you, then you shall be released from this oath. Only do not take Eth, my son, back there. Now, I want you to pay attention because this promise is something that's kept throughout the entirety of Yitzhak's life. He never leaves the land. When the famine happens and he's going to go sojourn somewhere else, he's told not to, but to plant in the land and he'll be fruitful. And he was, right? So the promise was given and kept by the hand of Yahuwah. That's just something I want you guys to see. I'm not going to point out any of the significance of all of these things that are being pointed out every time there's a an Aleph Tau, but I want you to think about it in the narrative and just what that might be foretelling, okay? Then the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. And the servant took ten of his master's camels. That's a word that also means like a boomerang to go out and come back. It means revenge as well. It's the word for revenge. They were named for their vent, their uh, their mean streak that they have. Right. That is one of three different re uh, gemel is one of three different words in the Hebrew that is a reward. You have gemel is the first one that's mentioned, and that is also related to the word yegamal, which is to wean a child. So the reward Adam had in what he did to the, the firstborn of the Almighty, he lived out in what his children did to him as a reward after they were weaned. That is the gimel in creation there. But that is the one type of reward. Another one is akob, like the word for Yaakob, which is he will return at the hill what you're doing. That happens to the non-malicious or the simple, whether they're doing good or evil, they are more expediently corrected or benefited in this life for it. And it is the sons of Yaakov that become Yisrael, or those who strive with men and El and overcome. Okay, so there's a picture behind all that. And then the other type of reward was Shalom. Gimel. Gimel is the word, it's the third letter of the Aleph Bet, Aleph Bet Gimel, and it's also literally the word that we have for camel. Gimel is a camel. Camel is where Gimel comes from, and it's, it's named for their taking vengeance. You're welcome. Sister was asking a question on the chat, so just wanted to elaborate again. And then, like I said, the third word for a reward is Shalom which all of these have their own connotations, their own meaning and representation in scripture. Real, really interesting to look into. I just gave you the one example. Well, I gave you two. Shalom, you, you can look at that one as well. But it says, And the servants took ten of his master's camels and left, for all his master's good gifts were in his hand. And he arose and went to Aram Naharaim, to the city of Nahor, and he made his camels kneel down. This is where the Arameans come from, right? That's why it says in Deuteronomy that the children were to say that our father was a wandering Aramean because Yaakov came from his father's area in Aram Naharaim, right? It says, and he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a fountain of water at evening time. The time when women go out to draw water. And he said, Yahuwah, Elohim of my master Abraham, now, it's translated as please, but just like Abraham had said now, 
And he immediately did it. And he's saying, now cause her to meet before me this day and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing here by the fountain of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, let down now your jar to let me drink. And she says, drink and let me water your camels too. Let eth her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Yitzach. And let me know by this that you have shown loving kindness to my master. So this is a kind of prayer that Yahu Nathan, the son of Shaul, also had. Where he wasn't just saying, oh, if you please favor me in some whimsical, non, non-substantial way. But he says, definitely, if this is to be, do this and then I'll know, right? Yahu Nathan, if you take the time to look at that account, or we'll get to it eventually, we're not, we're not even there yet. But he prays, or he, he mentions to his armor bearer, if the Philistines do such and such, then we know that Yahu has given them into our hand. And if they do this, then we know that it's, it's not. And then his armor bearer says, let it be, you know, let it be as you say. And then the very thing happened and they believed and did, and they were successful. So that kind of prayer with belief, the action involved in the belief in doing is very powerful. Instantaneous answers from the almighty. Here's one example of it. Yahoo Nathan's another. I've literally lived through this myself on more than one occasion, answered prayer by just asking and doing something in belief. Um, it might seem like a little bit of an embarrassing thing, but I'll, I'll tell you here because it's relevant. I was at the time coming off of a whole bunch of medications. I'd been disabled for about a decade. I was over 300 pounds, very out of shape and, and <clears throat> not in the best of health. My little dog had gotten out and was down the street, potentially harassing the neighbors. And, and I'd already gotten in an issue with one of my dogs with their with the neighbor's animals before, and I didn't want any problems. So it, it was an immediate concern of mine to take care of my dog, of which I, I really was not capable of doing. So I asked in belief while on my porch, my or on my deck, listening to my dog yap half a block away. I asked in belief that he would help me. And then I thought to myself, well, if I believe he's going to get my dog to me, I might as well go to the door to get him and as soon as i stood up i hear the dog barking at my door no longer half a block away but at my door barked twice and i open it and he comes right in no problems i my jaw drops open i say thank you father and i went about my business but i was absolutely floored at the immediate answer to my prayer and it was much later that i said oh, well you know it's because i stood up and said i, I believed it in simplicity it was the belief and the action involved with doing it that he's he 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 reciprocates. He, you cannot outgive your maker. Ob willing, this will make more sense to you as we you, you keep repeating it. But he gives every man according to their deserts. And when you're a simple man and you deserve and you do things, he returns that to you. All right. So to continue on here. This simple prayer asks in belief. He's not saying something whimsical. He's saying these definite things, let this happen, and then I'll know. Wayahi, and it came to be, right? Before he had ended speaking, that see Ribka, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the son or the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with a jar on her shoulder. And the young woman was very good looking, a virgin, no man having known her. And she went down to the fountain, filled her jar and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, let me drink now, now a little water from your jar. And she said, drink my master. And she hurried and let her jar down to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, let me draw water for your camels too, until they have finished drinking. And she hurried and emptied her jar into the trough 
ran back to the fountain to draw water and drew for all his camels. And watching her, the man remained silent in order to know whether Yahuwah had prospered his way or not. And it came to be, when the camels had finished drinking, that the man took a golden nose ring, whether it's a nose ring or not, I don't know. If you look at the, the Hebrew, it just says ring, right? But it's quite possible it is. He said, it took a golden ring or nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing 10 shekels of gold and said, whose daughter are you? Inform me now, that word again, nah, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Milcah, or Milcah's son, whom she bore to Nahor. And she said to him, We have both straw and fodder enough and room to spend the night. So the very thing he asked to be established as a fact in reality just happened. And then she also has room for him to stay. And the man bowed down his head and worshipped Yahuwah, he who causes it to be. That when you read the, and it came to be, that's wa yahi, that's yod, or that's he, yod he. It's a very similar word to he wa he. This means to be, to exist, to fall, like to fall, um, to fall upon what came about. Literally, what laid down next, okay? So, uh, he who causes it to be is literally the name of, of Yahuwah. And he said, Baruch, or Barak, or Baruch be Yahuwah, Eloah of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master. As for me being on the way, Yahuwah has led me to the house of my master's brothers. Then the young woman ran and informed those of her mother's house these matters, or Hadabar is the word, literally, right? And Ribka had a brother whose name was Laban, Laban or Levin, Levan, right? That means white, which we already knew that from a few readings ago. But, and Laban ran out to the man to the fountain. And it came to be when he saw Eth the nose ring and Eth the bracelets on his sister's wrists. And again, that could just be a ring. And when he heard Eth the words of his sister Ribka saying, thus the man spoke to me, that he went to the man and saw him standing by the camels at the fountain. Ten camels, by the way. And he said, Come in, Bar Baruch of Yahuwah. Why do you stand outside? I myself have prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man came into the house while he unloaded the camels and provided straw and fodder for the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were at with him. And this is one of the examples of the Aleph Tau being translated as with, because it's just Aleph Tau Wa, and they translate that as the men, those who were with him. And set food before him to eat. But he said, let me not eat until I have spoken my word. And he said, speak on. And he said, I am Abraham's servant. And Yahuwah has Barak eth, my master exceedingly. That word is ma'od which uh, I, I find to be a very interesting word. But they also have it in Deuteronomy 6, 4, or uh, the Shema, where it says, you will love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all of your might. 
that's that ma'od right there. It says, and has become great. And he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and male and female servants and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And he has given to him, Eth, all that he has. Just like the father has given to his son all that he has, right? And my master made me swear, saying, Do not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanim, in whose land I dwell. But go to my father's house and to my relatives and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, What if the woman does not follow me? But he said to me, Yahuwah before whom I walk sends his messenger Eth with you and shall prosper your way. And you shall take a wife for my son from my relatives and from my father's house. Then when you go to my relatives, you are to be released from this oath. And if they do not give her to you, then you are released from my oath. And this day I came to the fountain and said, Yahuwah, Elohim of my master Abraham, now, if you are prospering the way in which I am going, see, I am standing by the fountain of water, and when the young woman comes out to draw water, and I say to her, now give me a little water from your jar to drink, and she says to me, drink and let me draw for your camels too. Let her be the woman whom Yahuwah has appointed for my master's son. I had not yet ended speaking in my heart. Then see, Ribka was coming out with her jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the fountain and drew water. And I said to her, now let me drink. And she hurried and let her jar down from her shoulder and said, drink, and let me water your camels too. So I drank. And she watered the camels too. And I asked Eth her, first time the Aleph Tau's been in association with Rip, Ripka here, whose daughter are Eth you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. Another way, an, Two more phenomenon. We'll see one later on where the Aleph Tau will be removed from before Edom's name after he sells his birthright to Yaakov for porridge, right? Or red stew, as they call it, which is why he got the name Edom, Adam for red. And then another one, if you look at the book of Ruth, when Ruth becomes um, betrothed to Boaz, after that, the Aleph Tau is before her name when she's now in covenant with our creator as well. But before then, it's not mentioned. There might be other phenomenon where you can see the significance of this. But it, tragically, it's not something that's prevalent throughout the totality of scripture like it should be, I imagine. But it says, <clears throat> excuse me. It says, but or then I put the nose ring or the ring on her nose right there, okay, and the bracelets on her wrists, and I bowed my head and worshipped Yahuwah and Barak Yahuwah, or and Barak Eth Yahuwah, Elohim of my master Abraham, who had led me in the true way to take Eth, the daughter of my master's brother, for his son. And now, if you are going to deal in loving kindness and truth eth, with my master, let me know, and if not, let me know, so that I turn to the right or to the left. And Laban answered, Bethuel too, and said, The matter comes from Yahuwah. We are not able to speak to you either good or evil. This is the very words that were repeated by 
um, I think it's Laban later on when he makes a covenant with Yaakov, he's given a vision by Yahua, Yahushua, right? Our Mashiach appears to him in a dream and tells him not to speak good or evil to Yaakov, right? There may have been something like that from them in this regard as well, but we don't have that available in this text. I don't believe it's in Yobelim or the Dead Sea Scrolls. So if it was something that was there, it's now lost until we have those words back again. And it says, see, Ribka or Rebecca is before you. Take her and go and let her be your master's son's wife as Yahuwah has spoken. And it came to be, that's that wa yehi, right? When Abraham's servant heard eth their words, that he bowed himself toward the earth before Yahuwah, and the servant brought out ornaments of silver and ornaments of gold and garments and gave them to Ribka. He also gave costly gifts to her brother and to her mother, and he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there, or and spent the night. <clears throat> when they arose in the morning, he said, Let me go to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman stay at with us a few days, at least ten, then you go. And he said to them, Do not delay eth me. And that word is literally just Aleph Tau Yod. Okay. Or you could say, Do not delay my Aleph Tau. Since Yahuwah has prospered my way, let me go so that I go to my master. And they said, Let us call the young woman and inquire eth at her mouth. It's usually, it, it translates as, and ask her. But when you look at the Hebrew there, it's literally saying Aleph Tau at her mouth, which I thought was pretty interesting. It says, so they called Ribka and said to her, are you going with this man? And she said, I shall go. So they let go Eth Ribka. And that's the first time you see the Aleph Tau before her name after she gave voluntary consent. Okay. So, and remember, um, it's consent of the governed. It's unanimous consent. It's uh, two or more witnesses establish every matter. These are the things you can see in the narrative also playing out. It says, so they let go Eth Ribka, their sister, and Eth, her nurse, who's also in covenant and was also uh, of some of the the children of Israel were born through her. If you, or I'm sorry, that was later on their nurses. But my point was saying, even though she's not directly related, she's in covenant, right? Just like the servants of Abraham and and the men, they're all they're all there. Okay, these are also you know parables foretelling a, a thing. Like I've been saying, if you just pay attention to what's being spoken there, which I, I'm not going to go into detail about. But that's the kind of thing that you can see there's multiple, the truth is true in every context. And there's so many different layers to how these things play out. It's literally impossible for a man to fake it or to just make them up. That's why um, it's the manyfold hokma or wisdom of Elohim, right? And, and we and soon end our lives before ending our search of d discovering the depths of it. It says, so they let Eth Ribka, their sister, or let go Eth Ribka, Rebecca, their sister, and Eth, her nurse, and Eth, Abraham's servant, and Eth, his men. And they barak Eth Ribka and said to her, let our sister become Eth, the mother of thousands, of ten thousands. The birthright promise of multiplicity of seed, which was specifically the firstborns, which was taken from Reuben and given to Yahusuf, which was then put onto his children with Ephraim, the secondborn, getting the firstborn covenant as a pattern that was echoing what you see from the beginning there. 
the the second Adam getting the benefit kind of thing, right? But um, that would be the ten thousands of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh, as it's mentioned later on, right? So it says, let our sister become Eth, the mother of thousands, of ten thousands, and let your seed possess Eth, the gates of those who hate them. And Ribka, her young woman, or women, arose, and they rode on the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Eth, Ribka, and left. And Yitzach came from the way of Bier Lechai Roi, or Roi, which is the well of the living one who sees me. If you guys remember, that was named by um, Hagar when she was in the wilderness with her son. All right, so it says, And Yitzhak came, or came from the way of Be'er Lechai Ro Roi, for he dwelt in the south, and Yitzhak went out to meditate in the field in the evening. And he lifted his eyes and looked and saw the camels coming. And Rivka lifted Eth her eyes. And when she saw Eth Yitzach, she dismounted from her camel, and she had said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, It is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant of Yitzach, or and the servant told Yitzach Eth all the matters or the word Hadabar. He had done. And Yitzhak brought her into his mother's Sarah's tent, and he took Eth Ribka, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Thus Yitzhak was comforted after the death, or after his mother's death. All right. And um, it does not go into too much detail about how old he was when this happened. But we can infer, or we can know exactly when that was. Um, she died at 127, right? Yitzhak was born when she was 90. So he would have been, what, 37 years old now, right? That would have been seven years after he was 30. There's an interesting picture there, but I don't know if that had any other significance to it. All right, um... With that, I think we've covered everything that we were going to here. Um, again, I mentioned that there is a few places in this text where you'd see the Aleph Tau translated as with, and I showed you in the English there the few spots that it's at, but you'll have to compare it and you'll see that, um, you'll see what I mean because I just haven't found it when I'm looking on this one. But that's literally translated as with there. Or so, and it says, and it amounted her jar, right? That Aleph Tau, and then the hay is her. So there's one example. But either way, Ab willing, this is beneficial. You can see that the, the narratives our forefathers walked out, while literally true, are also foretelling events. Uh, they're all walking out the covenant. They're partakers of the truth. And in their lives, they they show forth or reflect the truth, just like our Mashiach can only do and say what he sees from the Father and hears from him as a reflection of the things that are true. He emulates that in his creation and in his ways of how he deals with us. So it's like that hand in a glove, hand in a glove pattern that we've talked about before. Either way, Ab willing, this is edifying you all can see the parable that's being spoken of there and maybe notice some other things that I didn't point out. If so, let me know. And you guys have a great Shabbat and a great week ahead. And we'll talk to you next time.